Thank you, Raf. I'm interested in proving properties about a, a real full system. And uh, I want, um, in this talk, to give us some uh, a summary of the experiences we've encountered so far, uh, so far uh, with this project. My name is Alain, and I was lucky enough to get help from a large number of talented people. Does anyone recognize the song? It's called Everything in Its Right Place uh, by Radiohead. And I feel it characterizes per perfectly what we're trying to do. And that is building a networked appliance that is correct, reliable, secure, confidential if necessary, efficient in its user resources and manageable uh, as well. And why are we doing this? Well, for one, um, I want to answer the question, are the tools and, and methods mature enough for a small team like us to prove interesting properties about an entire system? The second, I'm also a teacher, and I would like to have a hand in training the next generation of system builders, particularly those who are going to build systems uh, that hopefully will be correct and perhaps along the way prove some properties about these systems. And finally, I just like to build systems. So what are we trying to do? Uh, we're trying to build a very simple um, temperature sensor that runs on this uh, or any single board computers, um, preferably using a CL4. Um, why a temperature sensor? I just happen to have uh, neighbors in the school who have incubators with temperature sensors that are supposed to give them alerts when the temperature goes out of range. And last summer, it didn't work, didn't work very well. <clears throat> a lot of fruit flies died. <clears throat> um, here's the current software architecture for our system. Uh, besides a CL4, I think the largest interesting component is the software stack. Um, uh, notice also that uh, we're planning to use the SCL4 core platform, which I think is ideally suited uh, for this work. What's the status? Uh, we've built a number of these components, um, in particular, of, we have a full UDP and IP layer done. We have some parts of the fragmentation and reassembly layer done, some parts of the Mac layer. And I should note that all of this is implementing the IPv6 protocol. At this point, uh, I have no plan to support IPv4. Along with these functions, we wrote some unit tests to just convince ourselves that, uh, well, first, do we have a clear understanding of what these pieces are supposed to do? Uh, and then convince ourselves that our implementation is at least roughly doing what it's supposed to do. And I think actually, as a side effect, these unit tests also act as a form of documentation. Um, I've pulled some of these pieces together to do some integration tests, and I'll cover this uh, into a little more details in a few slides. I've stolen a piece of tooling from the SCL4 work uh, to generate some of the nasty bit fields uh, associated particularly with the uh, ICMP uh, various packet types. Um, and then um, I have early sketches of proofs from uh, some of these components. Um, I uh, worked around uh, one part of the reassembly process, um, and I will talk uh, about that uh, as well in uh, a little more details further down the presentation. And then, um, because I'm using this uh, tool from uh, the SCL L4 uh, project, I also happen to have um, automatically some Is uh, Isabel um, artifacts that I can then use um, for proving some other properties around the SCL4, I mean, the so uh, network stack. Finally, there's a few pieces that are still missing. 
uh, most notably the driver. Uh, but I think that's a good thing because now I can use the uh, device uh, driver framework to do this work. Um, I want to talk about or dive into the details of, of uh, three aspects of this work. Uh, the first one is uh, talk a little bit about the integration testing. Um, as you can see, I pulled some of these uh, elements, functions, out of my um, project, and I am embedding them into uh, a piece of C code that can run directly on a Unix kernel and make sure that the lowest layer can directly talk to the network driver inside the Linux kernel using raw socket. And I think this was um, a great thing, allowed me to uh, do some tests like, can I send a UDP packet uh, to my local host, or can I send a ping and receive a reply back? The only trouble is that the raw socket interface API is poorly documented, uh, in particular, what works in IPv4 does not translate directly into IPv6. You still need to make some different, different system calls. So uh, useful, but not necessarily easy to do. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, fragmentation and the reassembly process. As you probably all know, messages that are too big must be broken up into uh, multiple pieces. I'm showing this off by separating these blue wagon drains uh, with extra spaces in between them. And then once you have this uh, message fragment into several pieces, you can send them one at a time over the network. The network provides only uh, best service at, at that level. And so you may receive some of these fragments out of order. And it is the responsibility of the receiving end to properly rebuild the original message. And uh, the interesting way to look at this problem is not so much to look at the fragments that you're receiving, but rather to look at the holes that are still need to be filled. And so the receiving end is actually going to maintain a list, a data structure of all the existing holes that need to be still filled. Um, holes and fragments are both going to be abstracted away with what I call an interval. Uh, an interval is basically a position or an offset of the hole or fragment within the original message and uh, the length of that hole or fragment. And then uh, as I receive fragment, I must consider four cases. Uh, I start originally with basically a big hole uh, waiting for the first fragment of that, that message. And as I receive messages, I'm going to update my local data structure to account for the receiving of that fragment. Uh, the first uh, interesting case is when you receive a fragment that just falls right in the middle of an existing hole, in which case that big hole turns into two smaller holes on either side of that frag fragment. So you can think of it as the data structure having n elements and now end up with one more. Another case is when you receive a fragment that fits neatly on the left-hand side, in which case the existing holes just shrinks from that side. Symmetrically, you can receive a fragment that is, fits neatly on the right-hand side of the hole, in which case the, the hole uh, shrinks from the, the right-hand side. And finally, the fourth case is when you receive a fragment that fits perfectly into an existing hole, in which case I have now one less hole a less hole in my data structure. Um, I should point out that you, you have, have a transmission. Once again? You have no transmission. Yes, this is UDP. And for now, I'm just going to ignore packet loss or duplication. I'm going to ignore that for now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I should point out that this algorithm and this idea to look at holes rather than fragments is not my idea. It's actually something that is documented in one of the, one of the specification provided by the Internet um, Engineering Task Force, <clears throat> which uh, has an entire document describing this, this process um, and describes it, it, describes it in these uh, eight steps that are shown here in the C code. This uh, C function takes a single argument, a fragment that's just been received. Um, it has a global variable 
uh, a whole list, the list of all the holes that have been received, I mean, all the holes that exist uh, presently. And this function just iterates over these holes <clears throat> one at a time, asking first the question, does this hole interact in any way with the current fragment? That's step two and three. If they don't interact, I'm going to move on to inspect the next hole in the list. If it does interact, I'm going to delete that node. And then in step five and six, I'm going to figure out how, um, <clears throat> how this fragment interacted with, with, the, with the, the hole that I just deleted. And we'll ask or add, sorry, uh, new holes as necessary with uh, an updated geometry. At that point, I will break out of the loop and ask, is there any other holes in my data structure? And if not, um, I received all the fragments. I've rebuilt the original message. I can tell the caller that um, the message now is ready to be delivered to a higher layer in the software stack or a return zero uh, telling the system that I'm expecting more fragments. I have, for now, translated this algorithm and uh, other ancillary codes around that uh, C code into uh, Isabel by hand. And here I'm just showing one of the functions I wrote um, that takes two arguments, a hole and a fragment, with the assumption that I know at this point that the hole interacts with the fragment. And um, here again, we're going to have uh, the four cases. The first if statement says, <clears throat> I have a perfect fit, in which case I have deleted a node. I'm returning an empty list of holes. The second if statement basically says, I, am re I just received a fragment that like, falls right in the middle of a hole. I'm going to have to create two new holes of slightly less geometry and then package them in, into, a, into a, a, a list of two elements um, and, and return that value. And this is done by this helper function called uh, split hole C and etc. for the last two if statements, uh, when the fragment fits on the left-hand side of the hole or on the right-hand side of the hole. And I've used these uh, <clears throat> definitions to prove some interesting uh, early properties about this process, in particular forward progress and termination. As I <clears throat> receive fragments, I'm expecting my, the, the bytes that corresponds to all the holes that are still in existence to shrink as I receive fragments until I have no more bytes or no more holes and I have received the full message. Now I want to talk about um, checksum computation for the UDP layer. And this is an extract of the specification um, that describes the UDP layer. Um, here focusing on how to compute the checksum. Um, the checksum uh, process takes the UDP message and breaks it into 16-bit chunks and adds them together using a ones complement uh, sum. Um, UDP packages can be uh, even or odd in length uh, if the packet is in uh, of an odd length, the specification says that you need to pad your message with an extra empty byte or zero byte. And a separate document focuses on describing this process of computing the internet checksum, as they call it, um, gives some properties about uh, this computation, and also describes techniques to add uh, ones, I mean, do a ones complement add on modern machines that do uh, twos complement ad addition. And if you look at this code <clears throat> and you discovered that there's some problems with it, not a big deal. Uh, uh, I think any decent C programmer would soon realize that this address that's supposed to point to a byte need to be incremented by uh, two to handle the breaking up the message into two byte quantities and that this cast should really be a cast to a pointer to a 16-bit quantity. I later actually found out uh, an errata that describes this, uh, these errors and, and fixes them. But more concerning was this line. 
uh, caused me a little bit of trouble. I'm trying to understand what was going on with my computation. What was it not producing the, quite the result I expected? What is this line? Is this line going to cause me? Is, it, is this line causing me problem? And it turns out um, it's wrong, at least on big Indian machines. And I convinced myself to, that uh, this is, in fact, um, a problem. I've written this function in C and fed it messages of one of even length and another one of odd length. And I'm running it on my laptop, which is uh, based on an x86 uh, chip. And that's little Indian. And run it, the same program, on an emulated big Indian machine, a power PC. And you can see that the checksum for the even length message is actually a match modulo the byte order, but that for seven byte uh, or odd message length, it's just completely off. Um, that came kind of a, as a surprise to me, um, that a specification that people ostensibly read to build our internet machinery can get this part of the specification wrong and nobody notices. Um, so here we go. I wish I had kind of discovered this uh, through proofs rather than uh, trial and error. Um, maybe I'll, I'll do that uh, later. Um, uh, here we're reaching a, a point in the talk where um, I, I want, I want a, a sort of a plea for this community. Um, th this is our sum of the files uh, around the definition of 16-bit uh, word uh, computation properties. And I would like to be able to update these with, say, if it's not already doing it, uh, once complement arithmet arithmetic. Uh, but I found it not easy to read. And so I guess my question to you is, is it, do I need to be a better reader? Or can we add more documentation to these files that seem to be completely bare of them? Um, uh, we've reached the end of my talk. Um, um, I have talked about uh, building a system where everything is in its right place. Uh, in fact, I have a, a dream to build a perfectly balanced system, starting from the ground up, uh, starting with a processor, maybe based on the RISC-V architecture, and uh, build it in such a way that uh, is very efficient in terms of uh, its use of, re of resources. So, for instance, I don't think for the type of application I'm describing here that I need multiple core. If I have only a single core, I can use the existing SC, a proven SCL4 kernel. I don't have to wait for the multi-core extension. And also I can start optimizing uh, the software stack. Um, Lucy talked about uh, yesterday, lock-free data structures. Um, this is a place where if you have only one single core, um, you might be able to get uh, efficiency out of the system. Also, like I said, I'm a teacher and I'm planning on adding a class to our curriculum that focuses on the use of formal methods. I think um, Gervin has mentioned before that I think he's got a class and he might in fact be using this book. And um, I, th I think that might be actually a great uh, textbook to use for this, for this class. And uh, this is the end of my talk. Thanks for listening. I'll take questions now. Thank you, Alan. All right, we have time for questions. Um, this is more a suggestion than a question to push forward. It is perfectly possible to write the correct network stack that can still be cyber abused. So I suggest uh, as, as part of your proof, you can introduce things like how you handle a package that's damaged, out of size, because not, nothing of this is on IETF. Yep, and I completely agree with you. I, and, and in fact, I do plan on, on doing that. Um, I know that, for instance, um, in the Linux, they don't actually use a linear list of holes because that subjects them to um, denial of service attack. And stack. now they implement a red-black tree, and uh, I plan on looking at these issues as well. Uh, and, and sorry, I, I didn't mean to uh, for your 
previous questions before to ignore the fact that, yes, uh, UDP is the best service and, and packets can be dropped and duplicated. But this is definitely something that uh, is going to be high on my list to consider. Thank you for your questions. Um, since you're redoing the IP stack from scratch, um, how much would it simplify life if you know that the stack has only one client? This is in the context of yeah, yeah. Lucy's, right? Yep. We just treat yep. it as a library. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's a very good question. And to be fair, I haven't considered it, so I have no idea. Um, I know that my code is far simpler than whatever I, I've read out of the Linux source, source code. Um, but I, I'm definitely taking advantage of the fact that I am only going to be an endpoint. So there's a lot of a large body of code that I really don't need to consider because I'm never going to be a gateway. Um, so I think in that respect, it's already extremely uh, simplified. Um, and But like I said, I can send messages, I can receive messages. Um, it seems so far. Thank you, Gernot. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, I have a question for your, your journey. So what was the point? What was the largest work you did versus work you expected to do ratio on this whole thing? Um, and yeah, and, and the second question, so given that answer only makes sense, um, what's, your, what's your background? You said, uh, you, you mentioned that these files look like a mess to you. These files look like a mess to me as well. Um, what was it again? What was uh, like, what's, your, what's your background in verification? Do you have a background? Um, if you like doing this from scratch, yep, yep. pretty cool. That's, That's very cool. good. Um, I'll say a few words about the journey. Um, I mean, I think I would be dishonest if I didn't say that I wish I was a little bit further along. But on the other hand, um, um, we just completed the ICMP, ICMP layer or, or a good chunk of it. And I'm thrilled about the work that gone into it. Uh, particularly, I was thrilled of using these SCL4 tool. Uh, with regard to bit fields, because ICMP uh, packet type are kind of a gnarly, gnarly, gnarly piece of uh, uh, the specification. Um, but on the other hand, I'm here talking about something that's um, making progress and um, far enough along that I I'm willing to share this with the, this audience. So I think I'm in that respect pretty satisfied. Onto your second question, my background, I have actually limited. Um, I've always had a great interest in, in math and proving techniques. Uh, I did minor in math, um, <clears throat> uh, but I have limited background. Uh, I did work with model checkers in my PhD thesis to verify a coherence protocol, cache coherence protocol. Um, and that's kind of the, at, at that point, the end of my journey. Uh, after that, I think I picked uh, Gerwin's book and I, started to go through the assignments. Hi. Um, so two questions. The first one is that, do you hand translate every part of the C codes to Isabel, or do you run through the, um, the C parser and work from there? My plan, good question. Uh, thank you for the question. My plan is to eventually use this, this C parser and translate that automatically um, for now, um, but I haven't started that work at all. Uh, for the second question, this is about the experience. Um, can you tell us a bit about um, your experience of reading documentations in Isabel? So how foreign are the concepts are there in Isabel? Um, are, are these type theory things really scary? What about? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some aspects uh, um, that are quite special. Um, uh, in uh, like, uh, I'm thinking in particular about some parts of uh, the word definition that relies on some functional language concept that, um, and I have a fair amount of of, of back, um, background in, in, in functional languages, but they're starting to be quite difficult to understand to, to a newcomer, particularly when it's not even, and, and I'm not meaning to criticize it. I, I understand, you know, millions of code have been written and uh, um, it's an amazing achievement, but when it doesn't even give you a link to a, a piece of document that describes the abstraction that they're using can make it uh, for a challenging uh, experience. Um, 
but I think as a community, I think we can all pitch in and maybe improve the improve the uh, the, the, the state of the, the system and make it as as part of this overall uh, goal of SEL four to make it more usable, more friendly to newcomers. Um, we could perhaps help th that aspect uh, um, of the of the work a little bit, if we could. I can say some bits about the word library if you want. <clears throat> I've been meaning to write a blog post about um, the concepts used in there, um, which I probably just should. The in terms of comments, it's it's not easy to just write a comment there that would make sense to anybody. <laughs> like you could you could write next to that mysterious line, you could say this is a quotient type of X, but then it already says quotient. So, <laughs> and so if if I give you the link to a paper that explains what quotient types is, you're still not going to know why why that is uh, used for the word library there. In fact, um, like we didn't write any of that. That was a different. Well, okay, we wrote the word library. That version of the word library was rewritten pretty much from scratch a few years ago, um, in a way that is way more mathematical and way more abstract and, and also you know quite quite a bit cooler than before but um it, it would be that community <laughs> that we would have to talk to to um document those things um and it's kind of it's kind of hard <laughs> in in a way because it, it leads fairly far off into the weeds in, in mathematics and so on so the the thing I think that we should document for those are the interfaces, the things that you can use, and um, and so on. That, that's what I was going to write the blog post about. But other than that, I think documentation of some of these concepts is pretty hard. Like there's a book behind some of these lines. <laughs> and, and I'm very thankful for all the work that went into it. And I, I didn't mean this in a negative way. I understood there was a possibility that like you said, it's really hard to document. In writing a, a line of code that says this is a quotient type when the word in the definition use these words is, I agree with you, useless. In fact, I think it's a source of problem uh, later on because if you make a change to the definition and you forget to make the change in the comment, you've got inconsistency and we know where that leads. All right, any other questions? Um, right, well, in that case, I want to add a comment because um, I remember when I started in 2005 or six uh, with Isabel and I only had some basic background, it was terrifying and I was trying to sort an array. So to start with not much Isabel experience and go, we're going to go try on a network stack and see how well it goes. It's very brave, and the fact that you got anywhere is seriously impressive. So I want to say congratulations and thank, thank you. you.